What's up, guys? I'm Matt Galletta from Warrior Republic. Welcome to the Warrior Within podcast, where we talk to up-and-coming MMA fighters, we talk to famous fighters, and competitive grapplers. And with us today is Andre Allen, and he is the Warrior Within, also known as the Allen Wrench. How you doing, man? I'm doing great, guys. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I am an up-and-coming fighter. I'm a blue belt with no real accomplishments yet, but... <laughs> Definitely the future of jiu-jitsu at some point. Let me tell you, everybody sleeps on blue belts, man. You know, blue belts are dangerous. Yes, we lurk. We lurk in the shadows. <laughs> we don't know what's coming. I mean, like, it's not long before you're going to be a purple man. And then, like, you know, that's the thing about jiu-jitsu. Like, even though I've, I've most of my uh, experience, I'm one of those dudes that never had enough money to do jiu-jitsu. And I wrestled. Mm -hmm. And I was always known as like the jujitsu kid on the wrestling team because I'd be doing arm bars and stuff that I learned from these uh, videos. So, and we're talking nice. like 2005 or six. So anyway, um, yeah, so I'm a big fan of all that stuff, but I'm not really like formally ranked like you. So it's funny when people do jujitsu and they're a blue belt because it's not that long to hit purple. And once you hit purple, it's a lifestyle. Like you're not really going to drop the sport, I think, after that. Yes, definitely. Unless something personal happens, you know, you get a lot of people drop the sport when they have a kid, you know, that'll happen. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. For I, sure. I was definitely um, my intro to jujitsu was like 10th Planet YouTube videos. So I was like hitting those moves in the wrestling room whenever <laughs> I could. You know, that's the thing when it's I saw like you. Us. I was like, this kid's doing so many leg locks. And then I scroll down and I'm seeing truck like you're just trucking people. Yes. Yes, the truck. That that was like the first thing I ever uh, saw in jujitsu. It was so weird to me that hmm. that was like a real position, and I got obsessed with it. You know, that's I never. I don't think I ever got really good at it because I didn't really. Um, I didn't have the time to like study it properly. There's a lot that goes into the truck, and like a lot of people just kind of take the back from there, which I think is smart. So I don't really know. Uh, I don't know the whole like truck system, but I, I love. I love the position. It's so cool. Oh, yeah. Well, there's a plethora of, of like, there's toe holds there. You know, you can, most people, the split thing doesn't work. You know, you can yeah. even make the, 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 like, there's a Death Con 5 of making that, like, uh, that toe hold lock. And then you have this twister from there. You ever do twister from there? Um, yeah, in the training room. I never have hit, hit that in a competition um, before. I usually like to take the back in the competitions because I, I like arm bars. So. Oh, Arm arms. beautiful. Yeah, transition right to that. Yeah. The truck, it's kind of like, um, it helps to be really long, too, have, like, long legs. I don't really have those. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I do love it in the training room, at least. I've yet to hit a truck roll in a competition. Maybe you'll get it one day, because I'm seeing you, you're you doing it pretty good. <laughs> Thank you. What uh, division are you competing in, like, weight class? It's heavyweight. 200 pounds. I'm, I'm 200 pounds like on the dot, but pretty much walking around. So okay. I, I don't like to drop to 185 or 190. Um, and I try to only compete like for free. So I, yeah, 200 pounds. So like the last competition you won, you were competing 200 pounds, correct? Yes. 205 at, uh, at, um, tap cancer out. That was on uh Saturday. Congrats, man. Yeah, that was awesome. That was really cool. Thank you. Yeah, it was it was a it was a cool match. The kid was like jacked, so it was it was hard to keep my guard up against him. Hmm. Did you ever see him like do competitions before? Because I saw you had like about a month to like know who he was and look at him and stuff. No, uh, we were we were competing at Grappling Industries the same day, but I, I didn't really get a chance to like like look at his style. Um, Are I you a guy he... that does that? Are you a guy that looks into people's like videos before they go and fight? Yeah, very nervously, like in the bracket, I'll like look up people on Instagram and see what they're about to do. But I, I don't, I don't think that's like a great strategy, really, because <laughs> you, know? you could be w watching out for what they're gonna do from their Instagram, and then they go for something else, you know, and then you're not ready. So it's, you know, very true. You gotta look within, I think. So you're ten planet. You did ten planet jujitsu early, right? I mean, yes. I'm seeing that. <clears throat> no, that was uh that was like after I got my blue belt. So I got my blue belt in the gi um through uh -huh. Cavern Jiu Jitsu Academy. Uh my coach Lucas uh Rabello promoted me to blue belt when I was training in the gi over there. 
And then I was, so yeah, that was um, when I was living in Japan. And then I came back to the States in 2019. And then I started training under Gio Martinez. Wait, oh, wow, that's sick. Right now you still are? No, no, I, I went there for 10 months and I just moved home to Boston, Massachusetts. Oh, that's, where I'm that's really interesting. All right, we got it. We got it. We got to uncover. There's too much on bag here. So you went to Japan and then you got a blue belt yeah. in Japan? Yeah. That's awesome. Dude, that's, that's, that's fucking cool. Yeah. Well, it was through like a, you know, a, a American sort of Brazilian uh, team. It was just a chapter over there, you know. Everyone in the gym spoke English and stuff. I did train at a. <laughs> okay. Um, at a, at an all Japanese gym where nobody spoke any English. And that was pretty easy actually. Cause it's, you're just kind of like looking at the move and um, you don't really need to hear what they're saying to just, you know, look at the move, you know, mm. and do it for yourself. That was pretty cool to just have like silent uh, jujitsu basically. Like I didn't communicate with anybody except for one guy in the gym who spoke English, but when I'm rolling and like people, you know, we're kind of asking each other about the positions by pointing. And that was, that was very interesting. You know, you could kind of speak just using jujitsu. Yeah. It's wow. a language everyone in the room understands. Yeah. It's universal language right there. Yeah. It's like uh, Katie Heron in the movie Mean Girls. She said <laughs> she loves math because it's the same in every language. That's how I feel. Yeah. Right. Right. That is true. They do say that about math. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other thing, like, why I wanted to have you on, let's get to some of the nitty-gritty for me anyway, like, I think it's pretty cool. You do these uh, you do these online challenges. You do the Instagram challenges. That's Tell me about that. Beef. It's like beef without beef. It's beef for the sake of itself. It's, uh, it's just, like, just, um, you know, if anybody wants, like, a challenge match, they could just tell me and I'll, I'll make it happen for free. You know, I have really cool coaches and um, I, I can always find a match. Or, you know, we could find him out over there if, if I can't. But, yeah, it was it's really cool. I've done it uh, twice now with um, two really cool guys who were up for it. I had, a, I had a purple belt challenge me who was, like, 10 pounds less than me. That was a cool sort of even fight. And then I had the only guy who was next in line was a white belt who was, uh, like, 145 pounds. And that was probably a way more fun match because – it's just like, you know, all right, yeah, you know, I say I'll take anybody. So, you know, <laughs> you know I had a 10-minute match with a white belt uh, who I had like 50 pounds on. And it was actually a pretty interesting match, you know. Both both tried to be super technical. So, oh, so he was pretty technical for a white belt. Yeah, yeah. And I, I tried to be really technical. I didn't want to just smash somebody in the ribs or, you know, jump on their knees or whatever if they're – willing to take like a match with me like that. So it, the match is, is, was, was pretty cool. Little exchanges of, you know, sweeps and guards and you know, all that cool stuff, you know? So how'd this start? Did somebody just talk shit? Cause that's a ballsy white belt, by the way, that guy's like yeah, 50 pounds. <laughs> it all started with this guy who I have yet to compete against. Uh, his name's Jay Jitsu on Instagram. Oh. We have long running beef where he like called me out on my, you know, my guard is trash and my leg locks don't work. And, you know, he's, he's a great guy. I met him at uh, Graveling Industries, but I'm still trying to make this match happen. I don't know why he hasn't, uh, you know, he, he has, he has kids and stuff. So he, he, um, you know, he, he needs to find the time, I guess, but he's saying we're, we're going to make it happen by December, but this is a big running thing with my followers and him, you know, Josh LaDuke and, uh, you know, Quentin Rosenzweig, and Ken Peters, I think they all got in the comments and started like trashing this guy for some reason. <laughs> Those are like, yeah, and they're like, "Oh, you don't know like well, you're a, you're this and that." And then like Jay came back and he's like, "I'm kidding, it was a joke, Kent. I love you. I'm so sorry." And then I'm like, "Ken, he's kidding." And it was like, "Yeah." So there's no real beef. It's just you know, it's it's just it's just beef for the sake of beef, you know. That's cool, man. That's cool. It shows there's yeah, not really too much animosity in the jiu-jitsu community. I mean, there is, but, like, you know. Because, honestly, with the challenges, I thought it was just someone like, you fucking trash, bro. <laughs> Fuck you. You're a faggot. I can take you. I thought it was shit like that. Oh, yeah, of course. I mean, no, we, Jay and I were going back and forth like that all the time. We were, like, I was, I was shitting on him for being a fisher, you know, and just, you know, being a boomer in general, you know, <laughs> immersing himself in, in fishing and hunting instead of, you know, the pleasures that await him in his own mind, you know, that, that's kind of a funny thing. Um, I think that's what people miss about boomers is they basically tra travel and, and, you know, participate in activities that don't 
grow them at all inside of themselves and they kind of just miss their own lives, you know? Right. It's, baby it's boomers. You're talking about baby boomers for, for people that are too, too much of millennials. Yeah. We're talking about your mommies and daddies. All right. Exactly. They, they, they progress through life by gaining material things. And at the end of their life, they try to impart wisdom when they haven't made any progress to, to attain wisdom. You know, it's, it's kind of fun, you know, so I just attacked him with, with that kind of uh, sentiment. I am a Zoomer. I am from, you know, I was born in 1997. I'm pretty sure I'm an honorary Zoomer, at least. <laughs> I think you, you, yes, I think so. If I'm a millennial, then I would like to spend my whole life trying to become a Zoomer. <laughs> well, I think that whole definition was skewed because I saw the uh, internet, like, changed it because millennial was, like, a different year, and then they changed it and lumped it, like, 20-something years or more. So I, uh, I don't follow myself as a millennial either. If you don't know what a VHS tape was to put that shit in, or you don't know some of the stuff, what it was like with American Online, you're, you're, you're mm -hmm. not in the same generation. Well, I did put the VHS tapes in. I remember watching Rugrats on an orange-colored VHS tape. That's right. That's right. The, the tape was orange. It wasn't just a label. They made the whole tape orange for Rugrats. <laughs> they should just have that as a definition. They show the Rugrats tape. It's orange. Like, you recognize this. That's your gen. Yeah. I think I might be a millennial, but yeah. But if, if anything's for sure, it's that Jay Jitsu is a boomer and he needs to fight me. <laughs> Jay Jitsu, come out, bro. What's going I mean, on, man? Really promises. Yeah, come on. We want to see it, man. Come on. I know yeah. it's the holidays. People people be getting on the way, but we want to see that action. Maybe 2021. Exactly. exactly. So what man. other challenges? Tell me about another one. What other challenges do you have aside uh, <laughs> from that? None, none. Nobody's in line, so the line is open for any challenges. It's gonna there be you fun. Go. Boom! Do you hear yeah. that, people? So you can go to the Allen Wrench we if you want to challenge this man. Go on Instagram. He's all open for that. Shit. I have a Hinzo Gracie black belt actually, who is trying to put something together between us. But so that would be an awesome match. But he's he lives very far away, so I, you know that's that's like if if I ever go over to where he lives, then I'll go. I'm sure you train with black belts, but have you ever done any competitions, open competitions with black belts? Yeah, yeah, I've, I've, I've uh, yeah, well, in, uh, like, you know, in the grappling industries in, like, Naga, you, you fight black belts sometimes, so, you know. Yeah, you won a Naga not too long ago, correct? Yes. That wasn't your, how was that experience? That was awesome, right? Five submissions yeah, that one was day? Pretty, that was pretty cool. It was, um... It was a little bit weird, because I've, I've always been competing, like, advanced Naga and advanced grappling industries, um and like my coach geo he told me at one point like you shouldn't compete up because like you're not going to adcc either way you know you're not the best in the world just because you're competing up and it's better to experience a competition you know trying to compete with people your own level so i totally um had a lot of resistance to that because i kind of like think of my jujitsu very highly or like probably have more like self-confidence than i should with my own jujitsu, which would still need a lot of work. So like, I really, really absorbed that. And I, I went back down to intermediate with like the blue and the purple belts. And, um, my first intermediate competition, I won gold and silver in the, in the, in the absolute. And then I came home and my first competition was intermediate Naga. And then I won double gold. So like, that was the point where oh, wow. I'm like, okay, Okay, now I can go to the advanced division. I can come back to the advanced division. I'm totally ready. And, uh, yeah, I feel good about, you know, making that journey. It, it reminded me, when I was in Japan, um, I was a white belt, like, forever. And I was like, why aren't I a blue belt? This sucks. And my very first competition, I got silver and gold in my own division. But, like, right before I got promoted to blue belt, I got, like, double gold in the white belt gi division so i was so happy and uh i was so happy that that's like my last thing i did as a white belt it's kind of like ready to move up you know right yeah cool cool yeah. so you went to you california know. too right you said you trained there so tell me about that um so right after japan correct yeah yeah training under geo was man that was like the most like physically active gym i've ever been at um it was like a real like sport team i have like nothing but good things to say about it. 10 Planet Oceanside. It was, it was it was awesome there. Huge mat, and there's, like, plenty of room to roll. And, like, it's surreal when you get in there. I, I, there's probably other gyms where they have this experience, but it's like a hot box. It's like a hot box of sweat 
Like they close all the doors. You're not allowed to turn the fan on during practice. Oh. And the whole room is black. So you see white fog in, you know, at 8 p.m. And, oh you God. know, <laughs> white fog is coming off of everybody's bodies and like hot boxing the room. You see Damn. the, you put your hand up and you see, you see your, your steam coming off of your skin. It's, it's so awesome. It's really, really like, not like any other gym I trained at. <laughs> wow. That's, that's, that's a, freaking unique. Yeah. I spent 10 months there and I, that was probably where I got to do a lot of leg locks on like, well, first of all, I, I wasn't able to do heel hooks in Japan. Like they don't have any real leagues in uh, Okinawa where I was living that allow heel hooks. Oh, that's so, interesting. In Okinawa. Yeah. Oh, wow. You really stayed in the homeland with the, even karate and stuff. Oh God. Yeah. I didn't, that wasn't for me, but uh, I was, um, <laughs> You're heel hooking all the karate black belts? No, no, man. It was like uh, I, I didn't, I wasn't able to do heel hooks oh, right. like even in, in training, like even in practice. Like we just practiced in the gi all day because that's all they had it was gi jujitsu. So, um, wow. I did one submission grappling match uh, in Japan, and I got, I lost to an ankle lock. Um, Daniel Reed from uh, Kaohsiung and BJJ in China. He like, sorry, I think, I think like Taiwan. I don't think that's really. Hong Kong, yeah. So, okay. Um, I'm probably still wrong, but he he like unblocked me, and I felt like my leg was going to explode. So, uh, you know, I it definitely the gi jujitsu didn't go into the no gi very well. That was when I was a that was when I was a white belt still. But when I came to America, you have heel hooks allowed, and you know I jump into this tenth planet gym. You know I've been like idolizing Gio Martinez my whole life. I've been looking up to this guy, and now I get to like roll with him every night, and I, I get to do heel hooks and learn how to do them right. That was like a huge, huge difference, you know? Oh, yeah, that's cool as hell, man. Yeah. So what led you to go to Japan in the first place? You're out work out there? I got to ask that question. Uh, Yeah, I was in the military for, for a while. I, I just got out. So. Mm. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So what, you can kill somebody with like a, you know, a plastic butter knife and that stuff? No, no, it was just, you know, nine, nine, most of it was just a nine to five, you know? Like you wake up and you go to work and then you take the uniform off and you go, you know, you, you, you go do your off time, you know, nothing crazy. Dope, dude. And your off time was, I'm going to learn jiu-jitsu and strangle people. Yes. yes. And a lot of people in the military, their off time consists of spending all their money on, like, alcohol, um, you know, because that's kind of some, some of the culture. And then a lot of people just stay in their room and play video games, which uh, doesn't cost a lot of money. But I, I think it still is uh, – you're, you're not really growing, you know. And mm – -hmm. um, when I was in Japan, I spent a lot of time playing like video games and that, that totally was like, I realized that that like wasn't cool, you know, cause I'm like, Oh, there's no jujitsu practice tonight. So I might as well play video games, but like, no, you can go to the gym, you know, right. or go, go get a stretch on, you know? Hey, I love video games as much as the next 14 year old, but you know, you're right at a certain point, you're not really doing shit. You know? And Japan yeah. has a very yeah. high gaming culture. Oh, yeah, Japan, you're in, like, the core of gaming culture. Oh, not Okinawa. That's very, very, uh, like, nature-y over there. It's oh, a jungle. Whoa. It's a total jungle. That's rural. Yeah. yeah, yeah, rural. And, like, the climate there is technically tropical rainforest. And if you, like, get out of the city, it's just a thick, like, jungle. Huh. Wow. And it's hot, too. It's super hot. So that's, like, totally even a unique culture in Japan. So what's the Okinawan culture like? What do you see that you experience? Um, it's like, it's pretty interesting. Like, um, you have, uh, you have like one story buildings for the most part, if, unless you're like right in the center of business. Um, there's like, I think I saw one building that was like multiple stories, like higher than three stories. And it was like this uh, sort of mall that you have. And even the mall is kind of like a ghost town. Like there's nothing really to buy there. Wow. It's mostly like office. It's like, it's like, Oh, the, the, the Okinawa mall. And like, you have like, you have like office spaces in there um, that like, a, like next to the stores that don't really do anything. Like no, nothing's very attractive over there. Yeah, what, 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 like a boring working culture. Yeah. You got like office I spaces in the mall. Called, I think there was a place called Kin Town and it was like really, really cool over there. And they had a bunch of stuff and there was like amusement rides. I think, I think I'm thinking of Kin Town, but okay. yeah, I never, I never really went anywhere. I just tried to get in the gym as much as possible. Mm. I guess I'm going to yeah. ask you your next question. So we're talking about gym muscles, fucking powerlifting, right? So first tell me about that, and then I'm going to ask you about conditioning and jujitsu. how you think that actually no, that is important. Was, 
That was about uh, Chris Scott. That was my opponent that they were talking about. He they were talking does power lifting. Yeah, he's the powerlifting wrestler guy. You know. Okay, I was actually listening to that commentary on the Instagram, and I thought it was talking about you. Yeah, I'll, I'll take it. I'll, I'll <laughs> so you do no gym, like like what do you do when you work out? You don't. What's your conditioning for strength like in jujitsu? I think um so like I just roll. I just love rolling so much, and I don't like drilling. Nobody does. Um so. Rolling is how I stay moving, I guess. But uh, I, I really want to break this, like, conditioning gap for me because I can roll, like, three times a day. Ten Planet Ocean Oceanside, I was doing a lot of rolling at one point. And, um, you know, I'm still, like, not really as strong as I want to be. And, I you know, I, I got some weight to lose, like, even now. So, you know, I, I want to get in the gym and do, like, solo work, you know, when I'm not rolling. And uh, right now I'm just getting in the gym and moving. Like, I'm not even trying to, like – put up weight or whatever like I'm, I'm like picking up very medium dumbbells and you know doing air squats and doing push-ups and sit-ups and v-ups and that, that's kind of what i'm doing now i don't want to get too like complicated and in my own head because uh when i try to like lift very precisely like three, 30 sets of you know five sets of 30 pounds or whatever it's like i do like three and then i i look at my phone to count the thing and then i just well what am i going to do next and like by that time my arms just hurt and i'm like oh shit it's been a long time i'm just gonna go home <laughs> so yeah like the mental aspect of going to the gym i think i really need to overcome that i'm gonna start like right i understand why people write notes you know but I'm, I'm very new to the gym so uh you know i'm hoping to find like a gym buddy or some more seasoned uh athlete to help help me help me work out better yeah because i saw the one post it was our story you're like ego lifting and like <laughs> yeah yeah, always ego. I stay ego lifting. What does that I mean? Think, well, um, it's like you you know how you have like a runner's high. Okay. Yes. It's like um, there's there's definitely like like descending to your sort of like you know I don't know I think it helps to be very arrogant when you're in the gym um you know and like you like look at yourself in the mirror if you if you look good in the mirror while you're exercising it really motivates you to to keep exercising and it makes you feel positive about yourself. So like I'll, I'll look in the mirror when I, when I exercise and like try to like think my biceps are maybe bigger than they are or, or whatever. But uh, yeah. Yeah. And just, you know, just knowing, thinking to yourself that you're like really in there to make progress and that you're doing something good by showing up to the gym and you know, you're not, you're not just doing this cause you have nothing better to do. You're doing it to make your own life better. You know, that's, that's kind of, that really helps when, when you're in there. So I, I think that's what ego lifting is. <laughs> no no you know what ego lifting is sorry it's like you put up like crazy weight that you're capable of lifting but doesn't actually help you get stronger oh, like, okay <laughs> you'll you'll get you'll get closer to a one rep max than than people who actually like have a good idea of what progress looks like, <laughs> oh, and how it, so like yeah. they'll, they'll put up crazy weight and they'll, they'll uh they'll just do it wrong but they're it's fine to them because they know that they can put it up i think that's what ego lifting actually is but <laughs> Oh, that's really funny, man. Yeah, I think you can ego lift effectively. So you're just saying, like, basically, you because it's interesting. You that guy's a power lifter. That didn't mean shit with jujitsu. You're just saying all your shits from rolling. It's just all rolling. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he um, he like he like smashed through me, man. He he passed my guard and mounted me and stuff. I I got the leg lock, but uh, strength like matters definitely if if stuff happens quick. But um, you you know, strength and endurance. I think really come from come from rolling. So like somebody could really smash you for like five minutes in a row, but then the strength kind of starts to die down after that point. That's why that's why I like rolling for like longer periods of time. I think that I can go without tapping and people will kind of get tired and, and we'll be sort of, you know, both doing technical stuff at that point. So I, I do the challenge matches. They're, they're 20 minutes long. That's that's my idea is 20 minutes. And I can't I can't last 20 minutes effectively but i think it's like i i think it's better to like kind of like let the jujitsu come out after both people sort of warm up in the match and then you know the strength dies down a little bit and you can sort of slowly go through the technical stuff i, I just love that right because you basically you know then you're so tired it's like all skill from that point oh yeah yeah definitely like in the roles i like all the best roles that I have are like at the end of practice, not at the beginning. Yeah, because you're all warmed up, right? And you're just feeling good. Oh yeah, and and you're tired, and you you have, 
you know, real problems to overcome. Like you can't just really keep somebody off of you forever. And like, you know, that's when you get more vulnerable and you have to work out like bad positions if you're not already doing that, you know? hundred percent. Yeah. And how many times do you compete by the way? Cause you're very frequent at competing. So um, I'll compete as much as I can. Um, I really don't have a lot of money right now. So I'm trying to compete only for free. I have the grappling industries lifetime membership, which is, which is great. Uh, you know, that, that'll help me until I'm a brown belt. And How's that work out? I don't know about that. Tell people. You, don't you, know. go buy, you ask them to buy a membership and they'll give you a lifetime membership and a code. That goes lifetime? Lifetime membership? Yes. Wow. But it's a little bit like, like if you're a brown belt, you already can be for free. Brown and black belts can be for free at grappling industry. So uh, it's, you know, it, it's, it's worth as much until you're a purple belt or until you're brown belt. But yeah, I'm going to be using that thing for a while, probably years. Dude, that's dope. Yeah, I think I'm going to stop doing Naga and, like, the good fight because I, I'm, I'm getting, like, kind of dissatisfied lately with competing in these in these events. And, uh, like, even when I'm winning, I'm kind of like, ah, yeah, but you could have done better. And, you know, every like, every time I compete in, like, a local tournament and spend all that time, you know, heading up there and waiting around for hours, it's like, man, you could just be getting better at jiu-jitsu right now. So, yeah. You know, I think I'm think I've kind of lost the love for doing these these big uh, brackets, but I'm still going to do probably grappling industries. And I'm really going to try to hit the uh, like the the promotions, you know, like tap cancer. That was so fun. Uh, so gi invitational in uh, Long Island. That was that was a lot of fun. Yeah. How was that? Right. That was a really cool competition. Yeah. Yeah. Freaking uh, I fought Patty Ice from 10th Planet um, because my opponent had to drop out for for health issues. And uh Patty Ice is like a, a prodigy. He's he's like I he is he is 14 years old. So I, I had no idea that that was the case. I thought he was like 17 or 16. Oh wow. But, uh, yeah, so 14 year old with heel looks allowed. I, I got I, I got a toehold and um I, I had no idea that I was performing a toehold on a 14 year old. So that was <laughs> I'm telling you jujitsu, man, it's like these kids, it makes them eat their Wheaties or some shit. Uh, yeah, I know it's it's awesome. <laughs> yeah, I just I had no idea that the age difference of of competing against like a very young person like and then uh, the second match uh, that was your first toe hold, a, right? By the way, uh, toe hold, yeah. Whew. And then the, the second the second guy uh, like like slapped me like really hard in the mouth and uh, <laughs> like like right like I pulled guard and he just started like slapping me in the mouth like combat really hard. Too big. Yeah, this yeah, ain't CJJ. Yeah. Yeah, I got the I got the heel hook, but I was happy I got the heel hook because I'm like, geez, that, this could just keep happening. Like the ref's not doing anything. <laughs> this it would probably just keep. Hey, he probably just keeps slapping. Me. <laughs> I was like, damn. Would you ever try and do uh, combat jujitsu later in your MMA? Uh, in Dude, yeah, I would totally be interested in that. That sounds interesting. And I, I always have been like thinking about going to MMA, but uh, you know, MMA is is a pretty big step away from like. You know, I don't know how to strike and I don't know how to wrestle very well. So I would love to take that journey into MMA. Yeah. But like combat jiu-jitsu seems like a cool little step up. Yeah, oh, oh. totally. I think it would be good. You don't need to be pro to be like an MMA fighter too. So in my opinion, if you're training to do uh, CJJ, why not get one or two MMA fights? And a lot of people who yeah. are in CJJ don't have that um, advantage. You know, I even see a lot of people who are pros. Um, Tom Galicchio, even though he lost one and won one, he probably yeah. you know would be a lot harder for somebody who doesn't know how to deal with strikes in their jujitsu. Because if you're getting punched, your jujitsu is a little bit different than normal. Got to change it up. You know? Yeah, I feel like I could get really badly hurt in an MMA fight, so I would want to like train for that, I guess, before getting in there. You know, train like. MMA, you know, you get your you get your head kicked in and you know get a, get a concussion. Right. I don't want that. Because right. like you said, you have zero striking background. No, yeah, none. Mm. I, oh wait, no, I did taekwondo when I was a kid. I did I did taekwondo. Okay. So you could do some spin so, kicks, or was that? Yes, I can still kind of get there, but not. <laughs> not I really need to do more stretching, and uh, I think I want to start kicking again because I I love taekwondo. Yeah, it's beautiful. And I, I kind of just stop finding time for it. I mean, that's the thing about martial arts. There's so many different art forms of it. It's just so beautiful. Like, I even, I recently had the privilege to uh, go to a gym that was a grand opening. It's it's actually Mike Rackshin. Shout out to Cool Rack at Cool Rack. You can go. Immortals, 
The Immortals. The Immortals Jiu-Jitsu. Led by the Sultan himself. Sultan of Strangles. Sultan of Strangles here. Yeah, that guy, he, he was awesome. But I had a privilege to hear Gordon Ryan himself. We're at a Taekwondo gym, and Gordon Ryan's like, yeah, why not? When am I going to learn some spinning kicks and stuff? Like, he was just oh fucking around, and I was like, dead on, what? Dead on impression of Gordon Ryan. <laughs> I watch his Instagram like so much. You have, like you, like you have no idea. Yeah, but yeah, he was. I gotta meet him. He was definitely he was awesome. like, like I was enamored with like how much somebody who's into jujitsu and grappling can appreciate and go like, yeah, no, I, that I would love to learn how to do some spinning shit, like some taekwondo yeah. spin kicks. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, taekwondo yellow belt over here, so I'm the subject matter expert on this, <laughs> you know. I'm here for your questions. It is cool. I'll actually give you one up. Do you know that there's a, and it's not really well known in martial arts, but people do kind of know about it now. Tricking. Do you know anything about martial arts tricking? That's like, you do like, a, it's like, like tricking as in like you do like impressive moves. Like you do like four spins in the air and then kick the pads. Yes. Uh, and except the pads um, aren't involved. No bad. There's guys out there uh, that can just do what gymnastics kind of does in gymnasts, but they add a take. It's usually out of Taekwondo gyms. Uh, a yeah, yeah. Good personal look yeah. up is basically a Michael Jordan of the sport is Michael Guthrie. And this dude, if you see this guy, there are no words to explain. Like you could say break dancing, gymnastics, all this stuff to make somebody understand what tricking is. But these dudes look like they're basically flipping in the air so much. It's like they're flying. Um, yeah. and if I know like, Oh, when are you going to use that in a fight, bro? These guys spin so much. If you don't know shit, or if you're just a BJJ guy, they'll fucking hit you in the head. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, Scott Atkins was, I, th I think has a background in, in kind of doing, mm -hmm. yep. yeah, he, he, totally. he, he, you know, he, he does, I think his own fight choreography and he, he has a lot of stuff in his arsenal like that. You know, the crazy stuff. Yeah. Undisputed. Have you seen Undisputed? Yes, yeah. yes. The Boyka. Those, those are some of the best, like, choreographed, like, martial arts scenes ever. And it's so perfect. Especially for because... modern movies. Oh, yeah. Especially for, and the spin when he does the uh, 540 or, or the kick, the roundhouse kicks. Oh, it's so beautiful. Yeah. Fucking Boyka. Yeah. Fucking Boyka. Yeah, it's so, it's so unrealistic, it's, but, like, great at the same time. Because it's like, it's like raw, but unrealistic. Yeah, exactly. Like, you know? That's what makes a great movie. But, uh, I think I think a movie that's both raw and realistic for martial arts is uh, Man of Tai Chi. That's one of my favorites. Oh, you just you just literally took a thing that I was going to ask you a question about. I thought it oh, was yeah. really interesting. I'm watching this kid's Instagram, and he, like, um, there's, like, a move he gets from Man of Tai Chi, this kung fu movie, and he uses it in a BJJ yeah. competition. Tell me that. Tell me about that. Yeah, it's, a, yeah, it's, a, it's like a diashi, like, like a foot sweep. It's a, it's a foot sweep. Like, uh, but it was from, like, I, the guy was behind me about to, like, pick me up and do it huge mat return the guy was huge uh we're actually really good friends right now um and uh but like w we were meeting for the first time there uh competing and he was about to do it like a big mat return and i just took my foot and i stuck it behind his leg and he fell he like fell over so that was i just i got that idea because the same thing happened in the movie <laughs> dude how many people could say they learned from a kung fu movie and used it in a competition i don't, I don't know i don't know man that's dope the, you know those movies are influencing all types of martial arts yeah, I got to spend more time watching television. <laughs> it's a waste of time. Learning. Just pick what you want to watch, bro. That's how I feel. Because yeah. you hear that goddamn commercials, you don't want to hear that corporate shit. But uh, going back yes. to like kung fu movies, uh, with my martial arts brand, basically we're making a martial arts movie. And it's called The Artifact, where somebody gets like this artifact, becomes twice as good at their martial arts or whatever i'm gonna in a nutshell leave it's it literally there. just like dvd fanatics that's like that's just dvds <laughs> is that the artifacts you know brad if we're here is coming to create dvds you know you have the percentage off ho 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 for christmas yeah. hell yeah <laughs> I love, I love what they've, what done. they've done. I think it's great, and I think it's great that they're expanding knowledge. The only warning I have is really a warning I give myself that I'm going to tell other people. You can get yeah. as many DVDs as you want, and you could flood your library, but that doesn't make you better. Sometimes so much to look over and so much to learn isn't going to make you grow. And what's better is to actually look at the moves you want to learn. Don't have a library. Have like a few DVDs that you're going to like learn most of the shit. Because, because yeah. other than that, you're flooding yourself with this ego or this like 
you know, overload. library overload, and you never can get practically great at the techniques. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Like, how do you feel about that? How uh, how much BJ Fanatics stuff do you uh, watch, learn, or I learned, I learned literally like all my leg locks from like Craig Jones's Z Guard Encyclopedia? That was like where where everything started. Nice. So. Yeah, so I'm very DVD. I'm I'm one of those guys you're talking about. I'm a very, very, I'm very, very. I've been very affected by DVDs. That's where like all my like. One hundred percent. Me too. Like, that's how I even started that's, ten that's, years ago. Yes, yeah, we started off of doing Ten Planet stuff in a DVD, and then I went crazier. But basically, like, I agree with all that. But what I'm saying is, I've got to the point where I've got so much uh, content, and I realize I'm not going over it as much. So I think it just. Leave it to proficiency. L learn at least a great volume of something before you go buy something else. Yeah. Uh, okay. I mean, I mean, if you learn, like, you're probably going all over the place, right? You know, that's cool too. But you know, no. if you yeah. learned, like, say, two thirds of Gordon Ryan's like passing thing, you know, instead of skipping all over, you would be like a monster at that, that sort of, you know, techniques. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Are you saying like don't like watch it in order? No. It's not like you're saying don't watch it unless you have a base. No, no. To watch no. It. I'm saying I'm learn, saying, learn like, like proficiently majority of what it's telling you before you go on to something else and waste a lot of your money. Oh yeah. So don't just have a giant like library of stuff and not like sit down and take time to study it. Yes, like, exactly. One hundred percent. That's cool. Otherwise, you're wasting hundreds of dollars to fucking fart around for the one thing that you bought. Or just listen to John Janner talk about the philosophy of triangles for two hours <laughs> instead of showing you oh, yeah. the actual yeah. drill. Yeah, and yeah, then you've, and done, you've nothing, done nothing, you know, because you, know, you didn't put any put applied any knowledge. knowledge. This is a triangle. Like you didn't, you didn't roll. Yeah, or exactly. You didn't... If you're watching so much of it, you don't have a a dummy or b a partner to go do that shit with. Uh, I think you've wasted a lot of money. And you're just listening to it more than using applied knowledge. I mean, you have a probably way better skills of jujitsu than me. So you can actually watch stuff, pick it up and roll. But a lot of people who are like lower level, let's say, or even other yeah. people at a higher level, they don't have a mind for it. They're not going to like watch something only and be able to pull that off on high level guys. Well, I, I really, I have the opposite experience. Like I, I'll watch like a long, long DVD. Like I watched like Craig Jones' Z guard and then a sale happened, and I'm like, oh, my God, Craig Jones was so cool. Uh, I'm going to get down under leg attacks. And I saw all of that stuff without really getting the chance to roll. I was watching those DVDs when I, I was – I had a lot of work to do when I was watching those DVDs. Wow. So I was doing – yeah, I was working nights. I couldn't make it to practice, but, like, I, I would – I you know, I would roll, and then it would just be part of my, like, game. You know, it would just it would just come up in the roll, and then and then it would, it would make sense to, like, go for it, you Wait, know? So you're saying, like, literally – I'm fucking wrong. Shut the fuck up. You watched it. I'm going to be honest. You're yeah, going to tell me like it works for you. I don't get how knowledge is like, I don't get, I don't get how you need to apply knowledge to retain it. Well, if something's like, so I feel complicated, like, you, just, like, 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 you for have me? the knowledge, use it if you need to later. I don't get how the knowledge goes away if you don't apply it. Well, it's just, you know? it's just martial arts in general. If you're not like always fine tuning skills, you know, at least in my, I, I was like, everything I'm saying is anecdotal for me, right? For you. Like come to, like you have to come to practice to be able to do it in a match. Yeah. Like say you never I, did a leg lock in your life, but you just watched it on DVD. Like, yeah, you're going to, maybe yeah. you'll get a leg lock, but are you going to get it on somebody who like is applying leg locks and knows that shit so well? You also have to apply that same type of skill set to get good at it, right? Yeah, it's not a, yeah yeah sorry man i'm I, I suck i don't know what i don't know why i'm having trouble with this concept <laughs> so. no it's okay but i'm actually it just sounds like, like you I love you. That unless you apply the knowledge you don't understand like what you're like you don't you, you don't retain it or understand it right right exactly. like I'm just, you know. okay all right but I think that's cool that someone like you, you're like, dude, I just watch it and I can fucking do it. So yes, dude, Z guard down under leg attacks. And then the grapplers guide, I got the membership to the grapplers guide and I still keep going back to it. It's a great website. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Lachlan Giles and Craig Jones, like really like, I love how they explain stuff like in a really simple way, you know, is it the really, Australian really accent or are you actually like intrigued by it? No, I'm just kidding. I do I, I do like the Australian accent far superior to the New Zealand accent. Um, 
But uh, yeah, I like. Um, I, I think like Danaher, when I watch like Danaher's YouTube videos, he talks in terms of like philosophy, which is really cool. You know, he makes these wide ideas that you can apply to jujitsu, which is like, I've ne I never hear people do that. But like Lachlan Giles um, and his student, you know, Craig Jones, who, you know, got his black belt from Lachlan Giles. I like, they kind of talk in this term of like sports science and like Lachlan Giles is a sports scientist. So hear hearing that is, is really, really cool. Like they'll, you know, they'll say like, oh, I can get out of this position because you know when you're like they'll they'll like get up and it's like you know when you're like sprinting and you have to open your hips and like you do and it's like i don't know the way they explain stuff in relation to how the human body works i think is i, I just love that for some reason i'm, I'm like drawn to that so well, is he, really he's a physical <laughs> therapist or he's some type of like you know he has a background with human anatomy and knowing that right so that's yeah like yeah cool as fuck. he's a physical therapist with a phd in like he has a PhD now and um, he did his like, like his uh, essay, his thesis at the end of his PhD on uh, knee rehabilitation. So he's, he's specialty in knees. Which makes his leg locks probably super, super deadly, right? Creepy. So creepy. No, that shit's fucking dope. I have to go, speaking of which now I have in my mind, I got to ask you, like, all that funny shit you do with like editing, like I'm thinking of Lachlan Giles, like thing you had with the what year is it in Australia? And he's doing like the dabs with his feet. You know, that was hilarious. The videos you do, I want to shout out to anybody watching this and want to check out uh, at the Alan Wrench on IG. I love the comedy. So, where do you get that from? And like, just tell me why you do it. Um, I was like immersed in like meme culture for a while growing up. So, I love. I, I used to like love watching memes. Um, it's super boring to me now. Um, I, I like other stuff, but uh, I think what I kind of am touching is like absurdist comedy, like kind of everything's absurd. And the way that I edit some of these videos, which people enjoy is like how fast and hard ridiculousness can just hit you like during your life. Like, you know, it's basically like how real life works, but just like sped up into a 60 second video, just like ridiculousness and chaos can just come in and, you know, ruin, ruin your life and just start, you know, life can just start stomping on your face or kicking you around or pulsating and you, your life could just improve for no reason. And you'll never know why it improved. You know, it's life is, is so weird and violent with its changes, but like, we don't notice it because it's so like kind of gradual, you know? everything's very very gradual and you need to have patience to to see it so i i think that like like kind of what what makes it funny to people is like oh shit yeah this is what everything else is actually like it's just it, you know you just have to change some of the variables like every everything is really really changing all the time and like violent and funny and tragic and you know that i think that's why people enjoy some of the stuff that i post because it's it's I, I, it is it is an art. It's a work of art. It's a work of art that shows us our our lives and how how weird it actually is. Yeah, that's but yeah, another another reason I, I like making those videos is because you know ab absurdism points out um, why everything else that we do is actually absurd. Like, because you know your your whole life is kind of distracting from like important questions about you know, like deep stuff that you could be thinking about, but instead you're like watching TV or, you, or you're distracting yourself with sports or working out or whatever. And it's like this whole series of distractions. So that's kind of, you, you know, um, a, a, a meme is funny partially because it's a, it's a distraction that's marketed as a pure distraction. And it's like, you know, <laughs> you could be, you know, there's no other reason to do, to like participate in this distraction if it, other than to be distracted. And there's like an authenticity to that where other people tell you that you should watch stuff to like, I don't know, improve your, like you're going to improve your life with a self-help course, or you're going to watch the football game and, and become more close to your friends because now everybody knows how, how football works and you're, or you're keeping up with the, the new iPhone, you know, these like distractions that we have that are marketed that are falsely marketed. Like, you know, uh, you know, the meme, the meme makers, we're offering distractions that are purely marketed as distractions. And that takes away from the legitimacy of everything else, which is revealed to be a distraction, you know, kind of when you, when you think about it as a distraction. 
Right, because you know? they're all they're all distractions to make money, but the meme stuff is like a positive uh, distraction, you know, because your 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 guard yeah. is down. It's a distraction that attacks all other distractions, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like Batman. If you want to defeat fear, you must become fear. You know, <laughs> you must if you conquer fear, you must become fear itself. Fear with the only purpose of conquering fear. That's that's interesting. And yeah, I'm obsessed with stuff like that too, you know, like the idea of like facing your fears just in the purpose of conquering them, you know, not being scared because of some fake reason you have to be scared. It's like you're you're being scared just to be scared now, you know, you're asserting fear into your life so that you can conquer it easier in the future. Well, that's what I love about comedy. It makes you deal with the uncertainty of life or fear as they call it, you know. Um, yeah. Who are some of your favorite comedians, by the way? Because I almost called you by accident before going on this. I was like, don't call him Eric Andre. Even though I don't like that guy, but like that's that went through my head. <laughs> yeah, Eric's Eric's great. He's a little bit like like he, he kind of misses the mark a lot. And I, I used to love Eric Andre's stuff, but it, like you really see one episode and you see you see them all, you know, it's not right. So uh, yeah, I like he's he's cool. Um comedians man i don't like uh like if i see something funny it's gonna be on like a gaming channel or like a live stream or some some organic you know performance art that that just kind of comes out of people messing around i don't don't like seeing a comedy central video with like two million views on it of like tom segura at a bar dude listen to my fucking crazy trip that i had i was tripping on uh-huh. ketamine and like everyone's <laughs> looking at this literal clown like it's literally like that's not what comedy used to be it's like it's like clowns now people are just showing how drunk and fat and hopeless and you know selfish they can be on stage and like that's like funny to people it's like it's not like pointing out anything it's just you're just a clown you know you just become a clown and you're like a professional clown now you're paid to be you know, just it's not leaving you with a different thought that you had before. Yes. Because that was the whole point of like George Carlin and like Bill Hicks and, and stuff like that. They'd give you not yeah. just a joke, but it's an idea. George Carlin attacked everything about like what everybody believed. And <laughs> yeah, that's everything. That needed, you know, I, uh, Bill Hicks is great. Um, well, somebody that I liked a lot was, uh, and this is kind of like bleeding into this Comedy Central thing, but. Um, what is this guy? Doug Stanhope. That guy has some existential <laughs> to talk about. He's, that that's he's that great. was a yeah. I was obsessed with that guy for a while. He might not be everybody's cup of tea, but <laughs> no. he's that raw like I'm not your average comic, like a fucking man, yeah. fuck you kind of guy. Yeah, Louis C.K. got canceled, but before that, like I liked in, his him early, too. in his early career, that was like. So I see what you're deep. saying. Like, like yeah. I, honestly, I used to do stand up comedy for good like many many years and i see the shift too i see the shift from like the louis ck doug stanhope kind of ideas to like hey i'm just fucking drunk and like this happened it's like of course that happened uh because you're fucked up and you did it you did that event on purpose like i see what you're saying there's no like that's being a clown it's not like you had actual substance or you went on vacation and something cool happened or whatnot yes you know, it's, it used to be like like the best comedians used to come on stage and like shit on the entire audience. Yes, like, yes. You know, shit on the country that they're in or the city. You know, like Bill Burr in that Philadelphia special. That was the funniest thing ever. He like he just told everybody in Philly to go die and like he hopes that they get like in a traffic accident. It's like, you know, that very dark stuff that he's directing at the audience. But like the new comedians, they just direct all the humor at themselves. It's like, oh, look, I'm just a drunk well, you know, it's like you're doing like the audience is enjoying it because the audience can look down on them and think that they're doing better than the comedian, you know? Yeah, it's an easy escape of self-deprecation in that way. Yeah. Yeah. Like dopey, fat, single white guy with a neck beard <laughs> and just dressed like shit with food on his T-shirt. That's like literally what a lot of these like Comedy Central people are. And yeah, I don't it's... get it because it wouldn't work as a normal guy. Like that guy wouldn't get laid or be cool. But because you're a comedian, you got that platform. Like fucking food on the shirt, the neck beard that's braided. All that shit's cool. The neck, the neck beard that's braided. I saw that once. Yeah, it, yeah. It's like <laughs> it wasn't on a comedian. But I saw some dude and like just in the public, and I was like, "What the fuck?" 
self-deprecating comedy is it's like the lowest cheapest form of comedy honestly like when you just get on stage and self-deprecate and talk about how much you suck because it's like what i think about those people is they're just scared to offend the audience they don't want to attack anybody else or scared about an actual joke yeah because the whole point is nobody's safe like even like now aside from what you're saying too is like political ideology like as a true comic i don't give a fuck what your political ideology is carlin was all neutral. He didn't care who was president. He made fun of the president and the fucking runny. He didn't choose sides. Who are you talking about? Carlin. He didn't choose sides. Oh. I think that's the way comedy should be. You should never take a political affiliation. You should always be well, neutral. Carlin was, Carlin was very left wing. He was very, very left wing. If you listen to his stuff. The only thing that like could be interpreted as like sort of bashing the left is like he talked about people being too sensitive, you know, but he, he was a very left wing guy. Well, I'm not really left or right, but like, you know, there's certain things that are right on the left. There's certain things that are right on the right, you know, like I'm not one of those paradigm people. I think he hit it right. Like even like Joe Rogan, I think it's a very central idea of like taking both good from both sides. Well, there's a confusion about the political left and the political right where like you have like left wing and right wing. You know, we're so immersed in bullshit now. You can't even talk about facts without being put on a left or right wing yeah, exactly spectrum. and i hate that so, the left and the right is about opinions you know it's about you know nationalism versus like global egalitarianism that's basically it that's like it's an opinion based thing so if i say something is if i say joe biden faked the election or whatever or messed with the election that's not a right wing statement to make that's a statement of that is a statement asserting a fact which may or may not be true like, right you can't there's no there's no such thing as a right wing like fact, you know, and people have that confusion all the time. It's it's crazy, and and it sucks because as soon as you say something, people are like, "Oh, you're this," and like the truth oh, yeah. is, like, all oh, because somebody may have that opinion, that doesn't mean that's their their complete ideology of the way they see their eyes through the world on everything. Yeah, yeah, that happened with uh, like Lindsey Graham recently. Like, he's a very left wing person who's always been on the left, and he came out and supported like Kavanaugh and he asserted that like this behavior was totally like out of whack and not normal for people to do. And it like obviously politically motivated behavior and Lindsey Graham got boxed into the right, even though he didn't say any right or left wing opinions, you know, it's it crazy. All, in, all that is politics is just Hollywood for ugly people. That's what I say. <laughs> well, well I, I care about politics. I care about, I care. About I didn't people. say I didn't care about it. I said it's, I said it's Hollywood for ugly people. Like, all those people are control freaks, crazy motherfuckers. Like, well, anyway, I don't want to get on a tangent, but yeah. I completely see how, like, the way you see comedy and the way you see that, um, I can see it through your memes because you're not, like, taking it through everybody else's, like, practicality. You're not going, oh, I get my, my way I do videos from from uh, Carlin or from this comedian. You're like, dude, I just see some funny shit on a Twitch stream or just in life, and that's my comedy. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, and you know, there's just funny, funny stuff to notice in life, you know. So if I if I see it, I'll I'll just clip it and repeat it over and over to some music, you know. Yeah, like I think that's still, that's, that's fucking cool, man. Um, yeah. so also your little Toninism things you do, I love the leg locks. I know you met Gary Tonin one time. Do you like? What did you learn? What? Let's just talk about leg locks in general. Like you got into them when? Were you always part? They weren't always a part of your game. I watched Craig Jones's highlight of EBI fourteen before I like. I, I don't I don't know if I had already started or like I barely started, but I watched Craig Jones perform at EBI 15, EBI 14 in a in a highlight reel, and I just got obsessed with like I had no idea what a leg lock was or what he was doing with those with those heel looks. So that's what made me like get interested in them. I watched like Craig Jones on YouTube, and then uh, that was the first DVD I bought, Craig Jones's Z Guard Encyclopedia, and you know. I was a white belt getting kind of stuck in this lockdown half guard phase of like trying to win the rolls all the time and not letting anybody move, keeping them in lockdown and trying to go for the electric chairs. But uh, <laughs> like Craig Jones definitely opened my, uh, my like, like that watching that DVD really like made me step out of this, this sort of limited game that I was in. Cause I was, I was very impatient with like learning at class because you, you don't learn a lot, you know, you learn how to do an arm bar and I never even get the chance to do an arm bar cause I can't even, you know, get out of mount yet, you know, but yeah. So I had like a real guard that I had, you know, at that point. 
that was like my first real guard that I could play is, is a uh, knee shield half guard. And then the leg locks, man, those were just straight up on the internet, like Craig Jones, grapplers guy. That was, that, that, that's where they all came from the internet. And then uh, I got to train with people like Kyle Chambers and Kyle Bame in uh, 10 planet Oceanside. And, and they just helped me, you know, get my leg locks better. Yeah, you wouldn't normally think 10th Planet unless you're, like, in a 10th Planet school that they're that good at leg locks. Everybody's thinking of the rubber guard. Everybody's thinking of, like, you know, the twister. Yeah, yeah, I think Henzo Gracie is, is like, the best at leg locks still. Like, I don't think anybody's even come close yet. Do you think, like, uh, does 10th Planet just, like, the coach in his version of leg locks, or are they systematic kind of like uh, Danaher's? system yeah every everyone who's good at leg locks is going out with dan hair like whether they admit it or not you know they'll they even even in 10 planet that's what i meant planet, well they say like honey hole but like it, it all comes from dan hair you know all the influences it's it, it was a it was a huge new thing you know uh the stuff that he and eddie cummings did together it really really dictates what everybody else is doing whether it's like mimetic and like people don't know that that's where it comes from but like if you learn it, it i think it almost definitely came from that gym you know 100 percent. yeah so that that was like one of the single biggest things to happen to jujitsu technique is like his whole leg lock thing coming out you know so i'm going to ask you uh what are like some of your biggest or what are your goals for grappling? What's your end game? Do you see yourself in bigger competitions? Yes, I want to be in bigger competitions. I want to be in bigger competitions. I want to compete. And I want to get to a place where I can, like, actually, like, make some money competing. That's, uh, that would be so great, you know, um, because I love competing and I aspire to be a better competitor. And, uh, you know, I do have the faith that if I stay in the sport long enough, you know, even if, that doesn't happen for me. I could, you know, be a coach. I could get a black belt and become a coach. But I really just want to do jujitsu all day because I love it so much. You know, that's that's my end goal is to be able to do jujitsu like all day, all the time. That's that's a beautiful way to think about it. And you know, with that, you never know where it takes you. It could take you to Abu Dhabi. It could take you to EBI. You never know, man. Yes, and uh, you know what's important is enjoying the journey because. If you have goals and you don't enjoy the journey and then your goals get shot down, you it just it just it's just so soul destroying, you know. Never focus on the goal, right? So I think that's a beautiful note to end on. Just focus on your journey with jujitsu. Don't think of your competition or anything that's like mind heavy like that. That quote about the journey journey, not the not the destination. Yes. Me, twenty twenty twenty. I I said that quote. <laughs> Yeah. That's originally from the Allen Wrench. If you guys want to go check out uh, the Allen Wrench on Instagram, just at the Allen Wrench for Andre Allen. And if anybody's looking to have some challenges with BJJ, no money down, just a respect of the art, contact us. I'll do a bet match. I, I'm willing to do a bet match for like 50 bucks if a blue or a purple belt wants to take me on. So, yeah. Dope. Boom. There you go. And if you guys... <laughs> Definitely want to support him. Go and do that. If you guys liked anything you saw today, don't feel afraid to try and check out the Warrior Republic MMA website. We're going to have rash guards. I got cool shirts like this and supporting fighters. Thank you so much. Andre Allen, the Allen Wrench. Thanks, man, for coming on. Can I throw something on? Sure, yeah. go ahead. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, I just want to announce that we, I like my page is officially partnering with Transcendent Labs, the supplement company. So if you want to use a promo code wrench at Transcendent Labs, that money is actually going to go to me. I will actually get money from that if you do that. So this is the first promo code where I'm actually getting paid if you use it. So Support if you want to get man. some stuff, go to Transcendent Labs. They're giving me free gear. They're a great company. I would recommend them highly. Awesome, man. I love that too, supporting a fighter. Thanks a lot, man. You have a great, great Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving, guys. All right, man. Peace.